All right, here's lesson one of chapter 15, part two, where uh, we just finished talking about what equilibrium and dynamic equilibrium was. I hope you watched the North Kara online video as well as that TED Ed video. Uh, they are incredibly effective, so please make sure you're taking the time to watch those two short little videos. I think they're both less than five minutes long, so should be easy enough to do. When we get into equilibria, there's three different types of equilibria. Now, if we had the same time and resources available to us in a regular classroom, we would go through all of them. But phase equilibrium, which is really just moving between different phases, solid, liquid, and gas, all right, such as you know melting or freezing, those can achieve an equilibrium. All right, if you put water exactly at zero degrees, all right, water would melt at the same rate that it freezes. All right, slightly above, melting would increase and freezing would decrease. If we were slightly below, like 0 .01 degree, negative 0 0.01 degrees, then freezing would start to outpace uh, your melting, and we would eventually freeze the entire thing. So we can get into phase equilibrium. We will not, though. You might want to take a read through it again if chemistry is in your future, but no questions on phase equilibrium are going to make it to your chapter 15 quiz. Solubility equilibrium, we talked about this back in chapter 5. You might remember our radioactive iodine or radioactive iced tea discussion that we had when we figured out that dissolving and crystallization were happening at the same rate at some point and things were continuing to you know, bump into each other and work uh, through uh, a dissolving pathway or if you were at the carrying capacity for the liquid, you could crystallize things out. Solubility equilibrium, however, we did that in Chem 20, so it's a nice easy thing to remove. Uh, from chapter 15. What we do want to concentrate on is your chemical reaction equilibria. All right, this is the more important. This is what the whole unit is all about because we're just taking a look at reactions that are no longer quantitative. A good example of one here, and it's discussed in good detail on page 679, is the hydrine, hy hydrogen <laughs> iodine formation reaction. All right, we have the reaction between elemental hydrogen in its gaseous form, elemental iodine in its gaseous form, and the formation of hydrogen iodide, which of course would be a gas. All right, iodine, according to your periodic table, is solid. Hydrogen iodide uh, is gaseous, and so is um, hydrogen. In other words, this is happening under very warm conditions for this one example. Now, when we take a look at it, if I start off with just hydrogen and iodine as my reactants, hydrogen is a clear colorless gas, Iodine as a gas is kind of a purplish, burgundy kind of color. When we then have this in its gaseous form, we would see this sort of purple color within the flask. Now, I've just put these two things in there. Let's say I can freeze time. They're not allowed to react. I put the stopper on it. I put it in a place where I can observe it, snap my magic fingers, and suddenly I can allow these things to start to react. As they start to react, Hydrogen, which is clear and colorless, iodine, which is purple, will start to collide. They will start to successfully react because of the warm conditions and form hydrogen iodide product, which is also clear and colorless. So you might want the color picture on page 679 when you take a look at this. So as you start to produce hydrogen iodide, you start to consume some of the iodine. We would see this as a reduction in the purple color. Now, if this was chemistry 20, and I made iodine the limiting reagent, it would all be consumed. What would I have for a final color then? If iodine completely disappears, I would have a clear colorless reaction vessel because I'd only have excess hydrogen and hydrogen iodide. But no matter how many times we run this experiment, we see that hydrogen iodide is produced at the expense of hydrogen and iodine, but that purple color never totally disappears. All right, at a set temperature, in this case, 450 degrees C, we find that there's always a small amount of purple that will remain. This means that some of your hydrogen iodide under these warm conditions is also decomposing back into iodine and hydrogen, and so we can't completely consume all the reactant. At a point where you can see these concentration values, all right, this is my quantity or concentration here, once they become a steady state, Nothing appears to be changing anymore, and have I achieved an equilibrium. My concentrations have become steady and constant, which means the rate of formation is now equal to the rate of decomposition. And we no longer have any sort of 
concentration changes within our system anymore. So we get to our first equation of this one. All right, what we want to do is try and describe uh, what our quantitative state is within this equilibrium. Now, if this was a quantitative reaction, your actual amount of product would be what stoichiometry predicts theoretically, and you would get a 100% complete reaction. Remember, that's the word quantitative meant, was complete reaction. Because we're getting less, all right, back to that graph, because we're getting less than a 100% reaction, then we should be able to see a difference between the actual amount we can produce and measure versus what quantitative stoichiometry would predict. We will now start to see a difference from 100. So we use this to describe the extent to which the reaction goes to completion. Be mindful, this is temperature and concentration dependent. All right, so if I change the temperature, I will have a different yield. If I change concentrations, I will have a different yield. A 100% reaction tells us that we are quantitative. That's the chemistry reactions that you have seen up until this point. We now have three new other situations that we can look at and take a look at percentage concentration or percentage yield as a way of describing the position of equilibrium. All right, is it negligible? I got hardly anything. This would mean it's a non-spontaneous reaction, which is a term that we have used in electrochemistry. But this would be something that would have a highly endothermic nature if we look at thermal chemistry. This would mean that the energy barrier is way too difficult to climb in the current conditions, and it's almost impossible to make product. So we would essentially just have a non-reaction. If my percentage of product is less than 50%, we say that the reverse reaction is favored. In other words, it is a reactant favored equilibrium, which means you're still dealing with something that is likely highly endothermic, but the energy barrier is now not insurmountable. It's just really tough for most of those molecules to get over the hill. This is a lot like our little Ted Ed video where the little guy was crashing into the golf balls. And if the hill's really big, very few golf balls get over the top and into the hole. If the hill is very small, with the same energy of collision, I can get a lot more golf balls over that hill, so I can produce a lot more product. So it's again just relating to those energy curves we remember from thermo. And so we would indicate on our reaction that this is less than 50% complete. We can get into the exothermic reactions. All right, what well, might not be perfect, like hydrogen iodide, it would fall into this category here. You've got greater than 50% product produced, so we say that it is a product-favored equilibrium. This is now something that is likely exothermic with a small energy barrier, and most of those reactant molecules can get over that hill. Not, uh, uh, maybe all of them do, but what's happening now is that the reverse energy barrier is not insurmountable, and some of those product molecules can com uh, combine, collide, and get back into reactant state. So we don't get a perfectly quantitative position of equilibrium, but we would indicate where we are above the reaction arrows. And then finally, quantitative is greater than 99.9%. .9%. We say it's quantitative. We use the single arrow, which is what we're used to seeing in all of our chemical reactions to date. All right, so in the next video, we'll get through some of the practice uh, solutions. For some of those, what I want you guys to do is read up on ice tables in the textbook first. All right, page 681 has a good example of that one. And because we are going to have a initial state, a changing state, and an equilibrium state, we use what are known as ice tables to help organize our data to be able to do the stoichiometry. All right, this is an adjustment we have to make because we no longer have the quantitative state of a limiting reagent. So we have to take a look at a different information in order to make our predictions about what the equilibrium concentrations or states would look like. For this, this is ice tables. When I do it, please do it the way I do it. All right, this will uh, keep things organized. There's a lot of numbers going on here and there's a lot to track as we try and apply stoichiometry to equilibrium. All right, so adjust to this ice table idea. All right, there was a reason why in stoichiometry and chemistry 20 and so far, I've had you guys listing things vertically under your reaction. This was the point for it so that we can expand this information. All right, I'll see you in the next three examples in the next video.